Thank you very much for that very effusive uh, introduction. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm worthy for all of those values, um, but this is my first uh, outing at the Iran Heritage uh, to present to you uh, some of the glimpses uh, that I can provide for the achievements for the projects that I've been working on at the uh, British Library. Uh, some of the comments have already been preempted by, by the introduction, uh, but thank you very much, John, for that. Uh, and thank you also for the invitation to come here and speak. Um, so I shall begin. Uh, for the past three years, the Iran Heritage Foundation has, in partnership with the organizations, uh, with other organizations, spearheaded and generously supported the British Library's Persian Manuscript Digitization mm -hmm. Project, as already described, uh, consisting of over 11,000 works in almost as many volumes, the British Library's Persian collection combines a prestigious manuscript collections of both the British Museum and the India Office Library. To boost awareness of the collection and its accessibility for readers and the wider scholarly community, the Persian Manuscript Digitization Project aims to deliver on at least three uh, objectives in particular. Firstly, update and standardize existing published catalog entries based on the vast works of catalogers like Ryu and Ete and upload them to the online union catalog of Arabic and Persian manuscripts called Fihrist. The second is to catalog all Persian manuscripts acquired after 1903 and upload them to the same database. Uh, the first objective is complete, and the second is almost complete. Thanks, Noor. And this is the Fihrist database. So if you uh, ever want to search for a manuscript within the UK in the major institutions, all you need to do is type in there in English or in Persian or Arabic, and you'll be able to find most of the details that you want. Thirdly, and perhaps this is the most visually gratifying part, digitized Persian manuscripts, starting with some of the British Library's uh, treasures, uh, have already been uploaded. Almost 50 manuscripts have been uploaded uh, almost 50 manuscripts have already been uploaded and made available by the digitization project. Uh, and with the support of our strategic and funding partners, the project team hope to continue making strides in the achievement of yet further milestones in the cataloging and digitization of manuscripts for which there is always an urgent demand. So our project landing page uh, looks a bit like this, and if you scroll further down, you'll find lists of manuscripts in a coherent fashion, and using the blue hyperlinks, you can then go straight to your uh, preferred manuscript. So I've circled the manuscript for today, which is the Busan of Saadi, and if you click on the blue hyperlink, then you go straight to another page, which takes you to a description of the manuscript with a thumbnail of the first folio, Click on that, and then you'll go straight to the manuscript. Uh, and you can look at the manuscript in several ways. Sev a single folio, or with two folios open at the same time, right to left, or left to right, depending upon the manuscript, of course. And also, you can navigate through the manuscript by the second function, which goes backwards and forwards. You can jump right from the beginning to the ending. So it's a flexible uh, piece of software, and it's all on the British Library website. So please do visit it. In this paper, I would like to introduce one of the digitized uh, manuscripts that we've been working on. Uh, the British Library's Busan of Saadi, which you see up there, the opening, the first folio, verso, and the second folio, recto. Uh, the, 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 there are many questions over the manuscript. Uh, it's, uh, by the way, the number is additional 27262 for those who haven't yet um, acquainted themselves with it. Um, and there are many questions hang, hanging over its form, its status, and purpose ever since the acquisition uh, in, uh, in mid-19th century. 
Though an exquisitely produced luxury manuscript, its calligrapher, Hakim Rukna, led an interesting life at both the Safavid and Timurid courts, not at the same time, of course, but in consecutive order. He first uh, started off at uh, the Safavid court of Shah Abbas, and with a couple of uh, carriage clashes, uh, said, I must exit fast. So he left for the Deccan, and from the Deccan then quickly ran to the north saying, oh, there must be more gold there. Um, so he ended up at the Timurid court. Uh, and I would like to excavate from the diverse biographical sources recording his life and poetry, a few points that may help address the questions associated with the BL Bustan. Uh, as part of this effort, I shall also comment on the manuscript's supposed relationship with the Emperor Shah Jahan I. Um, I'm not sure if I'm wholeheartedly sold on the idea that it was created as a presentational manuscript for Shah Jahan, but we'll go into that just now. Um, before I move on to the manuscript itself, it's probably better if I say a few words about Sa the, the author and his circumstances. So here we have a selection of poets who are probably quite familiar. Of course, you could pick any other selection of poets. I've got Ferdowsi, Rumi, Nizami, Khusro, Attar, and Saadi, of course, and you can see their birth dates and death dates in an approximate fashion. So this is not a statement of the exact time that everyone died or was born. Uh, this is just a guide for you to um, understand the overlap between various poets. Saadi, whose full name is Sheikh Abu Muhammad Mushrifuddin Muslih, or sometimes also called uh, Mushrif Muslihuddin, uh, and I'm sure there's a whole body of scholarship on that. Um, he was one of the Sufis, uh, leading Sufis, moralists, poets, and pro stylists of the late Saljuk and Abbasid periods. He wrote in both Arabic and Persian, but he was best remembered for his contributions to Persian literature through his Kulliyat of poetry and his two opuses, uh, his two major opuses, forgive me, uh, the Bustan, the Fruit Orchard, uh, completed in 1257 and Gulistan, Flower Garden, finished a year later in 1258. Both are anthologies of philosophical, ethical, and spiritual tales divided into themed chapters. But whereas the Bustan is in the versified form of narrative rhyming couplets, or Masnavi, the Gulistan combines numerous forms of sophisticated poetry lodged within the structure of simple, unaffected prose, or nasri ari. This is an image of uh, Sa'di's grave at Shiraz. It's not, of course, an early uh, it's, uh, structure. It's quite a late Qajar, possibly later than that structure. Sa'di's reputation was not particularly susceptible to the peaks and troughs of fashionable poets, and his works survived beyond the tumult of his age and the period following, which saw the dissolution of his patrons, the Salghur Atabaks, who ruled the province of Fars, and even the fragmentation of their overlords, the Ilkhanid dynasty. With the rise of the Timurids, Sa'di's reputation and his works, the Bustan and Gulistan in particular, came to be revered even more intensely as part of a canon of refined Persian literature. Numerous deluxe illustrated manuscripts were produced in princely ateliers and imitations of Sa'di's works were patronized as homage to the timeless sage for the, uh, every new age. The most prominent of these imitative works is the masterful Baharistan, or Land of Spring, by the mystic, poet, prose stylist, and all-round Timurid trendsetter, Abdul Rahman Jami, who died in 1492. Uh, he flourished at the court of Sultan Hussein Baikara at Herat. Sa'di's fame and literary prowess reached South, uh, Sultanate South Asia during his lifetime, even as he traveled through the Punjab, Sindh, and Gujarat to visit the great temple of Somnath. With the re-establishment of the Baburid branch of the Timurid dynasty in mid-16th century Hindustan, known to us by the misnomer of the Mughals, um, the deracinated Timurid rulers clung ever more tightly to the promotion 
of their literary and spiritual idols, Sa'di being one of them. Having secured a relatively stable Persianate courtly culture, Sa'di's status as an ethicist came to the aid of a political imperative that sought to establish the foundations of ecumenical liberalism through the concept of sulh kul or absolute peace, which permitted ideally all sects and religions to coexist peacefully. In this sense, Sa'di's work was viewed as philosophically compelling and politically prescient. This is crucial to understanding Sa'di's pseudo-cultic prominence in Timurid propaganda as a law-giving poet who is reimagined as serving not his original masters, the Salghur Atabaks, but the House of Taimur itself. So here we have a British Library painting by Hashim that shows Sa'di in white approaching from the left towards Taimur enthroned in the center. And this is a painting from uh, the late Shah Jahan period. And so it shows one of the um, central preoccupations around Sa'di and the royal house of Taimur. Uh, this painting has elements that are borrowed from earlier paintings. So um, you can see that the figure of Sa'di, previously in white, is here standing in the same kind of posture, holding a book. And this is an earlier double painting split in different collections uh, where Jahangir is imagining himself communing with most prominently Sa'di. And Sa'di offers Jahangir uh, a book which has the signature of the artist Abul Hassan uh, saying something like, uh, sorry, Amale Abul Hassan Mufti as Surate Sheikh Sa'di Shirazi. The work of Abul Hassan learnt from the image or face of Sheikh Sa'di of Shiraz. Uh, so clearly, the artist is also trying to instill some sense of his own spiritual journey within this signature. The book that he's holding may be, a sim uh, may, may be symbolic, but it also might be a real book. Uh, a copy of the Gulistan, supposedly copied by the calligrapher Yaqut al Musta'asimi. Uh, and this copy was supposedly in Jahangir's own library. Uh, after Nadir Shah's invasion, this traveled uh, to Iran and is presently in the Gulistan Palace Library. These are two examples of uh, Gulistan paintings or Gulistan related episodes. Uh, from Shah Jahan's reign. Uh, the first on the, uh, on the right is a uh, painting that was added to uh, a, an earlier Timurid manuscript, uh, which was damaged in a fire uh, where uh, Jahan Ara Begum, the eldest of uh, Shah Jahan's daughters from his wife Mumtaz, was burnt. And in that process, whatever water damage was sustained is reflected in the structure of the manuscript. And that is possibly the most likely reason for the repainting of this manuscript. And on the uh, left is a much later Shah Jahanid uh, separate painting, I think inspired by uh, the Gulistan. Uh, there may be others related to the Gulistan cycle, but this happens to be not in manuscript form, but in an album leaf. Uh, the album, of course, dates from mid or earlier 18th century. To digress for a moment, the study of Sa'di's works was not, an import, was not only important to instill common cultural and ethical values, but also to educate elites in the basic principles of Persian literature, ranging from the simple prose, moving on to more complex forms of, rhetor of rhetorical, rhyming prose, as well as narrative, commemorative, and lyric poetry. Sa'di's works also occupied a significant position in the curricula for educating women within the confines of their domestic sphere. Even as the foundations of Persian were being eroded by colonial language policies in the mid-19th century British India, we still find a reverence for Sa'di's works read in their original Persian, but occasionally alongside interlinear translation in local languages. So this is a picture uh, attributed to Govardhan, 
um, in Tehran again, and it comes from Shah Jahan's reign, possibly later Shah Jahan. Um, but I don't know too much about it because I, 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 don't, I haven't seen it personally. And here's a similar scene, but much later from the 18th century. Uh, it conveniently says underneath, Sheikh Sa'di. Uh, Sheikh Sa'di is, of course, educating other women within the harem. And then we have an interesting Bustan manuscript from the uh, late uh, 18th century. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, a, a manuscript in the collection of uh, Tipu Sultan's mother, Padshah Begum. And the text is primarily in Persian, but the red text is interlinear Dakini Urdu. Uh, it's written in a very domestic, homely style, so maybe she wrote it herself. Uh, and this is also in the British Library's collection. We've only just uncovered it. Returning to this evening's subject, the British Library's Hakim Rukhna Bustan presently consists of 175 original folios, excepting fly leaves, bound within what appear to be the original boards. The spine and gathering are, however, European, probably dating from the period just after the manuscript's acquisition by the British Museum in, on the 9th of December, 1685, from Major General Malcolm, uh, more about him later. And this is the opening of the manuscript, which you've already seen in the, uh, in the software that we have on the British Library website. Um, so the first folio and the second folio. The Bustan has a total of 10 unsigned and unascribed paintings in an irregular, narrow horizontal format, surrounded by, large, uh, surrounded by text in large calligraphic nastalik, and mounted on folios with borders of alternating colors and illuminated scenes of gold line and wash, sometimes called tashir sazi or halkari. The paintings have all been executed directly onto the same paper as the calligraphic text. In other words, they're not originating from different sources and then added to the manuscript. The program of illustration is somewhat uneven with a large gap between illustrations towards the middle of the bustan. So this table quickly illustrates the distribution of images. You see almost at an interval of about 10 folios uh, images, and then towards the middle, a big gap. And then again, it returns back to the pattern of almost every 10 folios, you have more images. So now I'll quickly run through the images. Um, so the first is a young man with a lamb, quite ex self-explanatory. Uh, generosity of Hatim Tai. Uh, a man is left stranded and Hatim has a, 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 an animal available. Uh, so he sacrifices that animal simply for his uh, guest, uh, for him to have his breakfast. Polo players and the beggar in love with the king's daughter. Of course, that's hopeless. An old Sufi abandoned at sea. The reason why I'm skimming through them is that you can see them up online on the British Library website, so I shan't dwell on them much. Okay, so the humility of Bayezid Bistami. Uh, he's being dumped upon uh, with a bucket of water from above. I shall just point out the center action. Here's the bucket being dumped, and there's uh, the being dumped upon. Uh, this is a very topical subject uh, involving race. So here is an old man rebuking an old, uh, a black man for sitting with a fairer lady. Uh, her heart is broken simply because of the rebuke. A mother rebukes her arrogant son. This is quite crucial. This is part of Saadi's biographical uh, details encroaching into the text. Uh, where Saadi visits Somnath and discovers that the animated idol at Somnath Temple is actually mechanical. So it's not a miracle. Straight after this, Saadi had to flee. A man regrets glee at news of his enemy's death. There must have been a significant interval. 
And then finally, the Prophet Yusuf and Zulekha. Zulekha sits here within her veil. Uh, and this is the image that was, of course, on the poster on the website, so it'll be quite familiar to you all. The outer borders are limited in their design and do not vary to include geometric or abstract ornament. Instead, they focus entirely on naturalistic and fantastic animals in rugged, bucolic landscapes constructed with vignettes. And the animals range quite widely. Um, these include pigeons, pheasants, fighting cocks, ducks, cormorants, cranes, peahens and peacocks, ostriches and hawks, varieties of quadrupeds such as cattle, buffalo, donkeys, jackals, deer, gazelle, leopards, lions, tigers, camels, rhinoceros, and elephants. The occasional stone-throwing bear as well. Uh, and then there are also mythical mm -hmm. animals such as killings and dog lions and dragons and of course also phoenixes or seymour. So here are some examples. Uh, this is particularly complex. And that is a possible example uh, that might relate to the same kind of artistic vocabulary that is um, available to the people who are decorating this, uh, this manuscript. A mythical bird that provides water to other birds. And this is a composition that goes further back into Akbar's reign. Uh, this is a, manuscript, a dispersed manuscript of Jami. You can see it right there. And here's an earlier, more fantastical imagining of the same type of animal. This is perhaps a little crude, but the next one is a little more refined. And you can also relate this composition, perhaps, to a Jahangiri drawing in an album. Right, so um, as I've just mentioned, uh, some of these compositions can be tied in with earlier drawings and album uh, paintings uh, created during the reigns of Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. This may be significant in tying in the Bustan's creation with the artistic output of the Timurid ateliers. As we have already seen it, through these images, the Bustan's borders are constructed from two elements, the narrow inner border and an outer wider border. Each is made of tinted papers that more or less contrast with each other, but tinted papers from a similar color group, such as blue, purple, or green, um, are never paired together. Unlike the delicate naturalistic gold painting of the outer border, the inner border has a simple, occasionally coarsely painted trail of single repetitive floral motifs. This feature can be traced back to the simpler design schemes of manuscripts created in the latter part of the Emperor Jahangir's, reigns, uh, Jahangir's reign. Examples include the dispersed deluxe manuscripts of the Shahnama of Ferdowsi, the Garshasp Nama of Asadi, and the Farhange Jahangiri. So this is a painting pasted over the central text of the Farhange Jahangiri, but you can just about make out a line of text intruding outside of the main central border, and then the same kind of scheme. So the crucial difference is that in the Farhange Jahangiri, the borders uh, have gold motifs, but they are picked out in black ink. Suffused with pious formulae, phrases of culpability, and prayerful expressions, the Bustan's colophon, this is folio 150, 175 recto, uh, states that the manuscript was completed on a Sunday, the 26th of Rabi ul Awwal, the 10th uh, sorry, the 1,039, uh, uh, which is the 13th of November, 1629, at the Darul Khilafa Agra by Hakim Ruknuddin Mas'ud, known as Hakim Rukna. Several questions arise from this 
Firstly, although the date of the completion is clearly stated, it makes no mention of the time and labor involved in the transcription of such a large manuscript. Secondly, it undertakes the, uh, it, uh, why, uh, why Hakim Rukna undertook such a project is not made clear. Thirdly, what is the reason behind such elaborate pious expressions when a less conventional, uh, when less conventional modesty would suffice? Fourthly, and more obviously, who is Hakim Rukna? And I hope to be answering some of those questions now. I believe the first question can be answered by reference to another manuscript, the Chester Beatty's Gulistan of Saadi, Indian Manuscript 22. Also signed by Hakim Rukna and clearly a companion piece to the British Library's Bustan, the most obvious similarities include the nine paintings that are close in format, scale, and even the same artist's hands. What they lack, however, are the elaborately adorned borders that have subsequently been replaced by pale paper irregularly and sparsely sprinkled with flecks of gold. And I'll quickly run through those images for you. Uh, this is the minister pleads for the life of a boy. Next is curing a hydrophobic slave by dipping him in the ocean. Proposal, sorry, a proposal to cure the king with child sacrifice. The king says, I shan't go through that, and therefore uh, he recovers. So the message of that is clemency, of course. Uh, master of wrestling defeats his student. This is a very popular theme. Um, a hostile devotee falls from his excited camel. And you have a luxury loving hermit visited by the king who's surprised and disgusted. An unpopular youth is left stranded after his shipmates trick him. Sa'di's thirst is quenched by a damsel. And the subject that we saw earlier, which is that of the Qazi of Hamadan, who falls in love with the boy who's the son of a farrier. Uh, he's discovered the next morning by the king. And the Qazi exclaims, oh, well, the sun doesn't, hasn't arisen out of the west. It rises from the east, so therefore the doors of mercy are still open to me, so I shall repent. So the message is repentance. Unlike the British Library's Bustan, the Gulistan colophon is suffused uh, to an even greater extent uh, with pious formulae, phrases of culpability, and prayerful expressions. The inverted trapezoidal layout is similar as is the style of illumination. Therefore, the four, uh, furthermore, the four-line poem inserted by the calligrapher before the colophon statement is also the same. So you see that verse inserted here in the British Library manuscript and inserted here in the Gulistan Chester Beatty manuscript. It says, <coughs> Kilkam Khati Sorry, Kilkam Khati Cho Abedavan Sar Basafedad Guftam Baru Yehok Bemanad Nishaneman Jaja Zerut Bey Kalameman Sohan Kunand Jai Fatade Harkalam Ustohaneman. My pen draws a little draws a letter on the leaf like flowing water. I mean my mark shall remain on the earth. Everywhere they comment on the qualities of my pen. My bones are wherever the pen scatters them. Unlike the, uh, unlike the British Library Bustan, the date of completion in the Gulistan is slightly vague. It's stated as the month of Jamada al Avval, 1038, which is December 1628 to January 1629, again at Agra. If we recall that the British Library Bustan was completed on the 13th of November 1629, it is possible to estimate that the transcription of the British Library Bustan took between 10 to 11 months to complete. 
Assuming it took Hakim Rukhna approximately the same amount of time to complete the Chastabiti Gulistan, this pushes the beginning of the transcription process to the months of January to February 1628. And the planning of two such monumental manuscript projects must have been pushed even further back in time, perhaps even to the reign of Jahangir, who died in October 1627. The period of planning and transcription is significant for our understanding of Hakim Rukhna's intentions for the Gulistan and Bustan manuscripts as a set, and whether or not they have any connection with the imperial atelier. The British Library Bustan lacks the signs of any imperial involvement. There are no ornamental sunbursts or shamsa openings or decorated fly leaves to indicate the presence of ownership marks such as seals, uh, the librarian's annotations for inspection, custodianship, description, or valuation. There are, however, two areas where reasonable suspicions for the presence of such marks and annotations can be raised. The first is the beginning above the, ornamental, uh, above the or opening ornamental headpiece, or sarloch. So there you can see an area of erasure and under multispectral photography, um, it's revealed only a small amount. You can just barely see some calves extending up. So maybe that is kitab and maybe that's a different word like agra, but I don't know. It's difficult really to uh, make out something so fragmentary. So we'll need to work on this as part of our digitization project if possible. And the second is the area underneath the colophon, uh, where, again, more has been erased. But unfortunately, we've not been able to uncover much. Uh, there, there, I think what has happened is that more ink has been applied over the whole area, and then that ink has been erased uh, or removed by a very vigorous method. Uh, and so that's why whatever uh, inscriptions or seal impressions were underneath in that area, um, they just don't reveal themselves. But again, there's more work to be done. Whatever can be said, uh, uh, what can be said with certainty is that the process of erasing seal impressions and annotations is likely to have been carried out not long before or after the year uh, 1093 or 1779, which is the date inscribed on the seal impressions uh, that are available, I mean, that are placed at the beginning and end. So what I mean is these seals, they have uh, dates that are quite visible. On the other hand, the Chestabiti Gulistan contains signs that, if taken on face value, overtly link the manuscript to imperial ownership. On the verso face of the colophon folio is an elaborate inscription reading, Please forgive my Iranian pronunciation. Um, so we'll start with Allahu Akbar up there, and it's mostly undotted, so this is hypothetical. Sorry. <laughs> In Nuskaye Nafisa Ye Gulistan Ra Ke Sani Gulshane Rizvan Vabachate Zibay Nadir Zaman Maulana Hakim Ruknast Barsabile Tufa Va Armagon Bajhate Ala Hazrati Kaivan Hishmat Zi Jah He Izzat Varifat Jaiga Padisha Himamaliki Ingilistan Irsal Numud Harrahu Shahabuddin Muhammad Shah Jahan Padshah, Ibn Nuruddin Jahangir Padshah, Ibn Jalaluddin Akbar Padshah. And the translation for that is Almighty Allah, uh, completed in, uh, in safety and victory on the date of the 17th of the month of Safar, regnal year 11, equating to 1048 Hijri, which is 31st of. June 1639. This fine Gulistan manuscript, second only to Rizwan's garden, which is a reference to paradise, 
is in the beautiful hand of Master Hakim Rukhna, the rarity of the age. I sent this to his majesty of saturnal reputation, the master of honor, the locus of prominence, emperor of the realm of England. Its reader, uh, sorry, its writer is Shahabuddin Muhammad Shah Jahan Padishah, son of Nuruddin Jahangir Padishah, Padishah meaning emperor, uh, son of Jalaluddin Akbar Padishah. The validity of this inscription has been accepted without question. However, I would like to argue that the style of the hand, the unprecedented praise for Hakim Rukna, I've never seen him being called Nadir Zaman in any of the Shah Jahani textual references, um, the unconventional use of, re of regal titles for an unnamed English ruler. I mean, there are texts within uh, Timurid court practice that say that not even the Shah of Iran is to be called Shah. He is only to be called Vali Iran. So why is Shah Jahan here praising an unnamed English ruler? Uh, the anachronistic introduction of the neologism Ingilistan to refer to England, the word didn't even exist then. And I think these are all grounds to suspect the, the authenticity of this inscription. The presence of any associated Timurid li uh, librarian's annotations or seals coupled with the total absence of Shah Jahan's personal seal, which you often do see coupled with his own inscriptions in other manuscripts, uh, they simply do not exist in this fashion. So the whole thing stinks to me. If we disregard the evidence of this inscription, there is very little to connect either the Gulistan or Bustan manuscripts to imperial ownership directly. The colophons of both manuscripts omit to, de uh, to dedicate or mention the patron, the contemporary monarch, the regnal date, uh, even though Shah Jahan was already on the throne at the time that the Gulistan at least came to be completed. This is enough to weaken the case, I think, uh, for any direct Shah Jahanid connection. Hakim Rukna, that's he, it says up there, Hakim Rukna, and I believe it. Hakim Rukna's career at Shah Jahan's court uh, was reaching its peak at the very time that the Gulistan and Bustan manuscripts were under production. At the emperor's formal coronation ceremony, Hakim Rukna presented a three-line chronogrammatic Qit'a poem that surpassed the present, uh, those presented by all his professional contemporaries, such as Bibadal Khan or Kalime Kashani. The importance given to this poem can be measured by its quotation on an early double page enthronement painting signed by Nadir Zaman, Abul Hassan, the same one who painted the Sa'di and Jahangir scene. So um, on the other side here should have been uh, Taimur also enthroned on a similar throne, octagonal throne. Um, and he would have been passing to Shah Jahan a crown. Um, where that painting is, I don't know, but uh, this is the other side where these are the inscribed panels. So um, I've got some details. So Padshah is Amana, Shah Jahan, and then it continues, and I'll read the poem to you from another text. So the three verses are split into the three panels of throne. Uh, the last panel is slightly damaged. So this is a slightly more clearer transcription from a, uh, an early Muhammad Amin Qazvini Padshah Nama at the British Library, but it's easier to read. There are some minor variations between the verse that is written on the throne and this version, but only minor. And it reads, Padshah hi zamane Shah Jahan, khurramo shado kamaran bashad, hukme u bar ke alam, Hamcho hukme khuda ravan bashad. Behar saale juluse u guftam. Here it says shah guftam. Behar saale juluse shah guftam. Ta jahan baad dar jahan bashad. And that translates as Emperor of the Age, Shah Jahan. May he be happy and victorious. May his orders to the universe's creatures be ratified like the orders of God. 
I say in every year of his reign, may he remain on earth as long as the world. Soon after the poem's presentation, Hakim Ruknar's annual income was boosted to an unprecedented 24,000 rupees. Yet, the Hakim's failure to capitalize on his newly found rapport with Emperor Shah Jahan uh, by not dedicating or in some way withholding the formal presentation of both Gulistan and Bustan manuscripts indicates that the calligrapher had reserved them for an entirely different purpose. Calligraphic specimens by Hakim Rukhna are rare, but not entirely unknown. Nonetheless, I've yet to come across references to the existence of other large manuscripts transcribed by him, which puts the Gulistan and Bustan manuscripts in a, in a peculiar category of unique one-off works. When considered in light of the overtly pious phraseology deployed in both colophons, a, partic a, a particular motive that has not yet been considered thus far comes to the fore, that of spiritual penitence. As already discussed, Saadi's works were the focus of particular moral and spiritual contemplation wherever they were read. To suggest that the one-off act of transcribing the Gulistan and Bustan in that order uh, was an elaborate personal gesture of introspection and penance is not too far-fetched as a motive, I would argue. Indeed, official regnal chronicles of Shah Jahan's reign, the Pad Shah Namas, often hint at Hakim Ruknar's restless desire to leave court and to embark on pilgrimage. What exactly lay at the heart of Hakim Ruknar's anxiety is unclear. His opportunity, however, came with the departure from the court of the Safavid emb embassy of uh, Muhammad Ali Beg back to Iran. Now, this is Muhammad Ali Beg, um, uh, painting in the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, it is clear from this that the Hakim was less concerned with pilgrimage to Mecca than with the ritual visitation or ziyarat of the martyrium and shrine complex of the eighth Imam, Imam Musa al Riza, at Mashhad. That Shah Jahan awarded the Hakim before his departure in the autumn of 1632, or the 8th of Rabi'us uh, Sani 1042, uh, uh, Shah Jahan awarded Hakim Rukna robes of honor and 5,000 rupees to cover the costs of his travel and continued to pay him a pension in absentia for the rest of his life. This indicates that the ruler and, Hakim and the Hakim uh, separated on good terms. So I don't think there's any motive of rancor between them that might have uh, initiated the uh, Hakim's departure, unlike when he was at the Safavid court uh, where personality clashes with Shah Abbas caused the Hakim to first flee. Um, and then also with Jahangir, he didn't quite get on with Jahangir, so for several years he was also in disfavor over there. So what happened to the Gulistan and Bustan, you might ask? The post-production life of these manuscripts is unclear, but what um, I would contend is that they both traveled with Hakim Rukna in his baggage train, along with other luxury goods from the Timurid court, such as paintings and drawings, items that could be divested in exchange for cash as and when required. So this is a detail of the royal collection painting uh, that I showed earlier with the label saying Hakim Rukna. Um, and the reason why I'm showing this is that there is evidence that another copy of this painting um, was taken by Hakim Rukna or someone in his train and that that was circulating in the Safavid world. Right, okay, so here is a drawing from the Freer Gallery uh, and it is specifically dated here 1050, which is 1640 and that comes barely eight years after Hakim Ruknar departed Shah Jahan's court. So if material is already circulating that looks like um, it would have been carried by Hakim Rukna, and Hakim Rukna is selling off a lot of his goods. Um, so I think that's one possibility that we should entertain for what happened to these manuscripts. 
Hakim Rukna retired to his native Kashan following his pilgrimage to Mashhad, and there he spent the rest of his life uh, re in relative comfort, writing poetry, befriending and m mentoring uh, other poets such as Sa'ib. If the Gulistan and Bustan manuscripts were not already offered as endowments or vaqf to the Mashhad shrine, then it is quite probable that they were dispersed within Iran after Hakim Rukhna's death sometime in the mid 17th century. There are various dates speculating on the Hakim Rukhna's um, death, mainly in poetic tazkiras, but I'm not sure about their reliability, so I, let's just leave it at mid 17th century. It is clear, uh, sorry, uh, it is in the early 19th century that the story of these two manuscripts heats up again. In the context of British efforts to win over Qajar Iran from sliding towards ne uh, Napoleonic France, the embassies of Major General Malcolm, Gore Oosley Baronet, and Sir Harford Jones uh, lay down the foundations for renewed Anglo-Iranian relations. As part of this enterprise, the Chester Beatty Gulistan was dispatched as a suitably lavish gift which was duly acknowledged as having been sent by Georges, and Georges is King George IV, um, by the grateful Fat Ali Shah. And Georges is mentioned right here, Allah Hazrat Qavi Shaukat Georges. However, part, uh, apart from this inscription, the connection with George IV is not as firm as has always been assumed. The binding, uh, sorry, yeah, okay. The binding uh, is, this binding of the Gulistan is in an extraordinarily vivid pinkish red velvet uh, with emblems added all around the royal cipher in metallic uh, embroidery. However, similar examples of, the of this particular design, cipher, and use of materials from the reign of George IV have not yet been found. Clearly, more research will be required in the Royal Library and Archives to authenticate the binding. But in the absence of authentication, I think there's enough to suggest that this kind of embroidery could have also been done by those who were preparing the manuscript for gifting, not necessarily via England, but possibly also via India. While the Chester Beatty Gulistan traveled from the west eastwards, ironically, the British Library's Bustan traveled in the other direction, exiting Qajar Iran around the, around the period that the Gulistan entered it. According to its English owner, Major General Malcolm, he acquired the manuscript by unburdening an, an unidentified, dispossessed Zand prince wandering as a dervish. How much was paid is not disclosed in an inscription appended to the Bustan's beginning, and this is the <laughs> inscription at the beginning. So over here, there's some erasure. So a word like Mazandaran or Kirman Shah was written and then altered afterwards. But otherwise, this is a coherent inscription, um, possibly not by Malcolm himself, possibly by a secretary, uh, etc. Many questions remain to uh, be answered if we are to fully understand the British Library's Bustan manuscript. In order to do this, it has been necessary to examine it alongside its companion piece, the Chester Beatty Gulistan. But while the British Library's manuscript has been digitized, thus making it easier to study, the same cannot be said of the Chester Beatty Gulistan, which I hope will receive similar technological treatment, so that the two, com uh, two companion manuscripts can be viewed side by side in a virtual digital format. By these means, I anticipate visual comparisons between paintings, illumination, and calligraphy can be better facilitated and basic codicological questions resolved. I hope in this paper, I have highlighted some of the advantages of digitization while also advancing the analysis of a puzzling set of early sub-imperial Shah Jahani manuscripts. Thank you. <laughs>